Well, let's look at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, starting in Mark 15, <coughs> verse 21. Jesus has been condemned to death by the Roman governor Pilate. He's been mocked and beaten by the soldiers in the Praetorium. And then a squad of soldiers takes him to Golgotha, which was a place just outside of Jerusalem. Uh, many people believe that uh, they know the site where Golgotha exists, and it is, uh, or at least was at one point, a bus terminal, which is kind of an interesting, I don't know what the significance there is. But anyway, it says in verse 21, they forced a man coming in from the country who was passing by to carry Jesus' cross. He was Simon, a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus. And as we went through this earlier, uh, it's most likely that these two men were known to the church in Rome where Mark was writing this book. And so it, they, they were part of the church there. So it's, although a really horrid thing that they forced Simon to carry the cross of Christ, it really ended up having an incredible impact on, on him and his sons. And they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means skull place. They tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, which was a narcotic, but he did not take it. Then they crucified him and divided his clothes, casting lots for them to decide what each would get. Now it was nine in the morning when they crucified him and the inscription of the charge written against him was the King of the Jews. They crucified two criminals with him, one on his right and one on his left. So the scripture was fulfilled that says he was counted among outlaws. Those who passed by were yelling insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, Ha! The one who would demolish the sanctuary and build it in three days, save yourself coming down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests and the scribes were mocking him to one another and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross so that we may see and believe. Even those who were crucified with him were taunting him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, Look, he's calling for Elijah. Someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, fixed it on a reed, offered him a drink and said, let's see if Elijah comes to take him down. But Jesus let out a loud cry and breathed his last. Then the curtain of the sanctuary was split in two from top to bottom. When the centurion who was standing opposite him saw the way he breathed his last, he said, this man really was God's son. We know from the other gospels that Jesus, when he cried out at the end, he said, it is finished. And then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The cross of Jesus Christ. We're not going to talk this morning about the physical part of the cross. We looked at that a little bit when we were going through the narrative here. But why is the cross so important? Why is it the central part of what we call Christianity? Many of us, I think, accept the reality of the cross without really understanding why it matters so much. So the cross, in its very simplest terms, was a substitution. It was a substitution. Way back in the Garden of Eden, and you don't have to turn with me to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, but you probably know the story. Adam and Eve began as God had created them. They had fellowship with God. They would walk with him in the cool of the day. God gave them a job to do. They were gardeners. They were to tend the garden. They were to enjoy everything about it. They had a wonderful, harmonious, fulfilling, incredible relationship with God and a wonderful life that God had given them. But then he said one thing. He said, there's just one thing that I need you to obey me in, and that is to not eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He said, because the day you eat it, you will die. But what do you know? That's exactly what we did. We decided that we knew better, or more specifically, that the serpent who 
deceived Eve knew better than God. God said, this is poison. God said, this is going to end your life. Don't do it. Like standing before a cliff and we're wanting to jump off. And God says, don't. You're going to die. It's going to hurt you. And we say, I don't believe you anymore. And we jump off anyway. We ate the fruit of that tree. And in that moment, there became a separation between mankind and our Creator. A separation that we could never, gulf, never, never cross the gulf that existed between us. The only way for that separation and that relationship to be fixed was for God to do something about it. But that spirit of rebellion that we had in us was so infectious that each generation after Adam and Eve also became infected with that rebellion. And we went from bad to worse to worse. People often say, I believe in the innate goodness of humanity. And I am sorry to say it's, that's actually a false assumption. <clears throat> At our base, humanity is not good. We are, in fact, quite evil inside. <coughs> And given complete freedom, we do not evolve into the greater good. We devolve into the worst kind of evil that you can imagine. And we talked somewhat about that earlier, mentioning some of those who had absolute power, could do anything that they wanted. What did we find from them? Mass murder, greed, all manner of things that we would call evil. So again, it was only God who could repair this relationship. But yet, because God is just, because God is holy, nothing that's not like God can exist in His presence. And I've used this analogy before, but it's kind of like thinking that you can just walk into the middle of a nuclear reactor and be safe. That's not even a small way what it would be like for you as a human, infected with this rebellion, to go into the presence of a holy God. You would be incinerated faster than you would be in the middle of a nuclear uh, explosion or a nuclear reactor. It's not safe. The only way to make it safe was for you to die. And that's what would happen. That's what God said would happen. But what if there was someone who was not infected with that rebellious spirit? What if there was someone who was completely free of all that that had taken place in the garden? What if that person were to die? And that's what God did. Jesus came born of a human mother, but not of a human father, with the DNA of God himself, and then lived a completely innocent life and volunteered, in fact, purposed to die in our place as a substitution. Now, to understand why the cross itself worked, we have to get some history on the Old Covenant, on the promises that God made, the, the law that he wrote, leading up to Christ. And at one point when the um, Pharisees and the religious leaders were talking to Jesus, he, he said to them, you search the scriptures, meaning this old covenant, because in them you think you have life. But these are they that speak of me. Everything from Genesis through Malachi speaks of Jesus Christ. God was giving us hints he was laying the groundwork. He was showing us what it would be like when Jesus came. And so to understand the cross, we need to go back. You can turn with me, if you want to, to Leviticus chapter 16, verses 20 through 22. We're going to do a lot of scripture hopping. You don't necessarily have to do it. In fact, you can get the notes later on uh, the next couple days on our website, calvarynewberg.org, and we'll have those with all the scriptures up there for you. The idea with this substitutionary death of this perfect person, Jesus Christ, was the idea of a transference. Jesus couldn't just die and then be raised. I mean, that, that would have happened because he was innocent. Death couldn't hold him. That, that curse that God pronounced in the garden, the day you eat it, you will die, that didn't apply to Jesus because he'd never rebelled. He wasn't born with that spirit, that rebellious spirit in him. So there had to be a transference of the stuff that we all have done onto him, and then he would die. And this is typified in one of the sacrifices that's articulated in Leviticus. And it says, when he is finished purifying the most holy place, 
This is where God's presence was in the midst of the tent of, meet, tent of meeting and the altar. He is to present the live male goat. Aaron, who was the high priest, will lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the Israelites' wrongdoings and rebellious acts, all their sins. He is to put them on the goat's head and send it away into the wilderness by the man appointed for the task. The goat will carry on it all their wrongdoings into a desolate land and he will release it there. This became known as the scapegoat. That's where we get the term. So you can see here, this picture is of the sin offering where, where we would, uh, the high priest would lay his hands on the, the goat and then all the sins of the people would be transferred through Aaron into this goat. And then it would go away into the wilderness and it was taken outside the camp. Now most of the offerings were slaughtered and then the blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat, which was the, on the top of the Ark of the Covenant there in the Holy of Holies. And the idea was for a covering. It would cover the people's sins. God would overlook them. It was like um, if you've ever put verithane on something, right, to try and keep it waterproof. So it's like the blood was this verithane so that God would not punish the people for their sins for the next year. So how does this relate to this transference that happened with Jesus Christ and the cross? Well, in a sense, we all laid our hands on Jesus before he went to the cross. How did that happen? When did that happen? It could be that it took place when the guards tied him up. They would have to have grabbed his hands. When they struck him, when they literally nailed his hands and, he, and his feet to the cross, their hands were laid on, on him, representing all of us, and all of our sins were transferred onto Jesus. And then he was taken outside of the city, as we saw here, to Golgotha, to a place outside the camp, just as the scapegoat was taken outside the camp. So listen to how the writer of Hebrews then talks about these two things coming together. In Hebrews chapter 13, it says, For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the Holy of Holies by the high priest as a sin offering are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also suffered outside the gate so that he might sanctify the people by his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing his disgrace. So there was a transference of all the rebellion that's in us onto Jesus when he went to the cross. Secondly, he became sin for us. He became sin for us. And we find this in Paul's writing, 2 Corinthians 5.21, where he writes, He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us. In a way, God made Jesus to blame for all the things that you had done. Not that he had ever done anything, but he put the punishment upon Jesus. He made him to become sin for us. And then Paul goes on to say, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We'll get more to that here in just a little bit. But God made Jesus bear all the guilt for our iniquities, though he himself was innocent, and he took our sin and then he gave us his purity. So God then placed the punishment for all of our sins upon Jesus. And we, we see that foretold in Isaiah chapter 53, which I think I've mentioned to you is uh, one of the greatest chapters in the Old Testament that talks about the crucifixion of Christ. So incredible is Isaiah 53 that a lot of Jews will not read that chapter. It's so specific, and in there it says, the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. Now, we saw during the crucifixion in verse 34 in Mark 15, where Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What was happening then on the cross at that moment is that the Father was turning his back on the Son. 
There was a separation that only happened then, had never happened before, and would never happen again. And in Isaiah 54, we find what uh, the prophet said about that. He says, I deserted you for a brief moment, but I will take you back with great compassion. See, the Father cannot be in the presence of sin. And so, our sins were transferred upon Jesus. The punishment for our sins was laid upon Him, the guilt for our transgressions, and then God turned His back away from Jesus as He was absorbing the, the dew for every little tiny and every great big giant thing you and every other person has ever done or ever will do. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So then, Jesus said, it's done. It is finished. So then Jesus died as that fulfillment of all of those sacrifices in the Old Covenant and then sprinkled His own blood on not the copy of the Holy of Holies, but the real thing in heaven. And it was done, as Romans chapter 3 says, as a propitiation, which is a great big Bible word, but it essentially means a cleansing of our sin. And you can reference Hebrews chapter 9, verse 21 through 26 about that. But unlike the animal sacrifices, which were a covering, and it wore off, just like your verithane will wear off, if you leave it out in the Oregon weather for too long, every year those sacrifices had to be redone and redone and redone, but not with this one because it wasn't just a covering, it was a cleansing. Those, those iniquities, those sins, those rebellious acts that we have all done, they were done away with as if they had never happened. This is a once for all cleansing that Jesus accomplished. And what did it do? It satisfied the Father. Romans 5 verse 9 says, Much more than since we have now been declared righteous by His blood, we will be saved through Him from wrath. We have been cleansed all the things that we have ever done or ever will do have been paid for by Jesus. So what does this mean? Just um, a couple things to mention here. Uh, the first thing, and, and these will be somewhat of a review, it removed our sin. Yeah, wow, I mean, we just kind of say that, but <laughs> unbelievable. You could never do that. He removed our sin. And Psalm 103 says, as far, as far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. And the word remove there is a, a Hebrew root word that means to widen. And, and so the idea here is that the, the, um, uh, God has so much removed our sins, the gulf is like er getting all wider all the time because you can't ever travel east enough to go west. You know, you're always going east all the way around. So that's how far away He has removed them. And not only that, it says that He has blotted them out. The uh, book of the Revelation uh, talks about how everything that we have ever done, said, thought, the motivations of our heart, everything is all in a big database. And God will, and He calls them books, but you know, it's basically a big database. Uh, the servers in heaven are just out, out, you know, talk, talk about cloud computing. I mean, you know, anyway, so anyway, everything you've ever done has been recorded in this database. And when people come before God without having uh, appropriated this sacrifice of Jesus on their lives by saying, I want that. <laughs> I want you, Jesus. I want to belong to you. I want to become a part of your kingdom. If they don't do that, they go, you know, I'm pretty good on my own. They say, the balance between my good and my, my bad, at least in my own mind, it tips toward the good. So when God sees me, He's always grading on the curve. And so He'll say, you know, you've done more good things than bad, so I'm going to let you come into my heaven. I don't know where we get that, but it's a common misconception among people. So God's going to double-click on our life a little bit. And He's going to show us all the things that we've done. And all he has to do is show us how we've been inconsistent with our own values. 
there will be no one at that meeting that will go, no, God, you're wrong. Everyone will say, you're right, but I still don't want to have anything to do with you. That's the, really the odd part that I don't understand. But anyway, uh, to, when it talks about, um, in Isaiah 43, 25, it says, it is I who sweep away your transgressions for my own sake and remember your sins no more. That word remember, it's the word to mark. And that's the idea of writing it down in that database. He marks it. But here he says, I'm going to sweep it away. And that word is to literally like rub like an eraser. So, you know, you write something down. Oh, I didn't like that. And I don't know if they do this anymore in school, but you know, you have these erasers that are like yay bigs. They, they figure you're going to make a lot of mistakes. And so then you would, you would rub the eraser on the pencil and you would blot out what you've written as if it wasn't even there anymore. And then you could start over again. And that's what Jesus accomplished for us in blotting out our sins. God's not going to mark them anymore, any of them. Any that you have ever done, any that you will today when you walk out the doors of this church, or any that you will do tomorrow or for the rest of your life, they're all erased. So then he redeemed us, redeemed us. Romans 3.24 says, They are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Redemption means to release through a price paid. Do you ever put anything on layaway? I don't know if they do that so much anymore. I know, I know it's still around. It used to be a much bigger thing. But you'd put something on layaway. You would say, I, now we just use credit cards, right? I guess that's the new layaway. <clears throat> So you go to a store and you say, I want that thing. And so they put it up in the back room and they write you a little thing and they say, once you bring us the amount of money that is necessary to purchase this item, we will go back in the back room and we'll bring it out for you. And it was really exciting as you'd go in every week, you know, and you'd bring in your money and then eventually you'd pay off the item that you were buying and they would come out and here it was and this thing that you had saved up for. That's the idea of redemption. And so Jesus placed himself on the cross and paid the price so that, in a sense, the Father could go in the back room and bring you out and present you to Jesus. Here's what you purchased. We have been redeemed. We have been bought back. In doing so, Jesus fulfilled and then basically did away with all of that, all those sacrifices in the Old Covenant. That happened, we didn't read that here this morning, but immediately after the crucifixion happened, uh, we looked at this a few weeks ago, the, the, the curtain that separated the, in the temple, the holy place from the holy of holies, where the presence of God was, that, that curtain was ripped in two from top to bottom, signifying there was no separation between God and man, now through the body of Jesus Christ, which is what that curtain really represented, and there's no need for animal sacrifices anymore because Jesus did it once for all. Uh, you can look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, and also Romans 7, verse 4. Jesus cleansed our sins once for all. And he did that by tasting death. The very thing that God said would happen to Adam and Eve when they ate the apple. Notice I said that. It wasn't an apple, just so you know. We have no idea what it was, but it most likely wasn't an apple. So, but he tasted death so that we didn't have to. He died both spiritually when, when he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The father spiritually was turning his back on Jesus. He experienced spiritual death. And he, then he gave up his spirit. He experienced physical death. But when that happened, he actually was placed back into the presence of the Father, which I love how we saw earlier, I've forsaken you for a moment, but I will receive you back with great compassion. So I just love that. Jesus was saying, all right, Father, it's done. I'm dying. And then as he died, he was placing himself back in the hands of the Father. So how does that relate to us? You did the same thing. You on, you were with Jesus on the cross. If you have um, received him as your Lord, as your Savior, 
especially the book of Romans, talks about how we were crucified with Him. Um, you can look at Romans 6, also Colossians chapter 2. Romans says, For we know that our old self was crucified with Him in order that sin's dominion over the body may be abolished so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin, since a person who has died is freed from sin's claims. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him, because we know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, no longer dies. Death no longer rules over Him, for in that He died, He died to sin once for all, but in that He lives, He lives to God. So you too consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ. And what I want you to consider is that this life that He gives is not like this one-time thing. Like, okay, you blew it. I'm going to wipe all your old debt out. Okay, the books are now absolved of all debt, and here's a million dollars in credit. Now, spend it wisely. The life that Christ gives you through His death and resurrection is continual life. It's every moment life. It's life that will sustain you now, it will sustain you tomorrow, and it will sustain you all forever into eternity. It's not something that you just get and use up. It's something that you will always have. The moment God removes that life from you, then you're dead. And praise God, He will never do that to those that have um, given their hearts to Jesus Christ. So in that, He has reconciled us to God. Colossians 1 says, He has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him. Incredible! Holy, faultless, and blameless? You can only be that way through that sustaining life of Christ. And I love that word reconcile because it means to restore to a prior state of harmony. Remember how I was talking? We, we have that state of harmony with God. We broke it. Jesus has reconciled us back to that same state. It's, it's incredible. And not only that, it's not like he's said, okay, you can go to heaven, but you better like stay out in the rural parts of heaven. Don't, don't try and come near me. No, in, in fact, it says, uh, the Bible tells us that he has made us his kids, his children. Galatians chapter 4. But when the completion of the time came, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoptions as sons. And because you were sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Abba is a term of endearment, a term of closeness. You wouldn't just go up to somebody on the street and say, Abba. You only did that to your Papa Daddy. So it's not just that He reconciled us to be able to go to heaven, but He reconciled us to have a very intimate and close relationship with Him. And then in the process of this, He has changed us. We are in the process of being reformed. We're being reformatted. Romans chapter 7 says, My brothers, you also were put to death in relation to the law through the crucified body of the Messiah, so that you may belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we may bear fruit for God. And that means basically the character that you have will be more like the character of God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions operated through the law in every part of us and bore fruit for death. But now we have been released from the law since we have died to what held us so that we may serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old letter of the law. Do we all become perfect the moment we become little Christs? No. We are cleansed. God does not hold anything against us anymore. We have that sustaining life in Christ. We have been redeemed. We've been reconciled. We've been made His children, His close, intimate relationship with Him. There is still that old self that's trying to hang on, and He is putting that to death. Now, um, you, can, you have a choice once you become a Christian. You, you can either cooperate with that process, 
which the Bible calls metamorphosis, or you can not cooperate with that process. It, it doesn't mean that you're going to go to hell because you didn't cooperate with God's process of reforming you, but you're going to have a real difficult life because God is going to continually discipline you and let you know that He's at work in your life. And if you're at a point where you, don't, you, you accepted Christ, but you see absolutely no change in your life whatsoever, I would go back and look at your heart. Did you really trust Jesus? Did you really take Him as your Lord and Savior? Or was it just something you put on like a badge, a, a Jesus merit badge? Was it a club that you joined to meet people, to get ahead in life? What was your motivation for coming to Christ? If it's because you recognize this rebellion in you, you recognize your failure, and you recognize God's sacrifice through Jesus substituting for you, and you said, you know, pff, I want that. That kind of thing will result in change over time. You will find yourself changing. And the more you cooperate with that change agent, the Holy Spirit, in your life, then uh, it won't mean you won't have difficulties. But it will mean that God will begin really changing you into His character. So just in summary, Jesus on the cross stood in your place before God because you see, if Jesus doesn't stand in your place, then you've got to stand before God yourself. You've got to justify before the holy God why He should let you into His heaven. But because Jesus went to the cross, He stands in your place. And the Father looked at Jesus and He said, guilty, punishment, separation, and then payment received. Reconciliation and redemption has happened. Relationship has been restored. Sin no more. Joy forever. Absolutely incredible. I just want us to really consider that this week. Sometimes we just really take it for granted after we've come to Jesus. Sometimes we take it so for granted that I think we just go out and let our old self kind of have the reins again. And what we need to understand is that same power that brought you life is also the power that allows you to make better choices. Where you can say no to sin. Before, as we saw here in Romans, uh, we, were, we were enslaved to our passions. You couldn't help but sin. But now the wonderful good news is that in Jesus, you can make a choice. You won't always make the right one, but you will make the right one more and more. And the more you press into the Lord, the more you relate to Him as your Abba Father, the more He will begin to work that wonderful new life in you. And the best news of all is that it doesn't cost you anything. Pretty cool. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so, so very much that you were willing to go to the cross. You were willing to stand up and take what we should have taken. And then you were willing to give us what you deserved, and that is life. We will forever thank you for that. We will ever, forever rejoice over that. And Lord, this week we want to make this that you have done for us on the cross a more active part of our lives. Help us to see your redemption. Help us to see the reconciliation. Help us to see the new relationship that we have with you more clearly and help us to become then more like you. And just right now as heads are bowed, eyes are closed, you may be here, you may be listening or watching at another time or place. You may ne never have really considered the things of the cross. Oh yeah, you heard that there was this cross thing. It's, it's sort of just an emblem, of uh, a symbol of, of Christianity. It's our mascot. It's so much more than that. It means death, but going through death, it means new life. Please take a hold of that today. Grab a hold of Jesus. Say, Lord, I have rebelled but I'm done rebelling now. 
I want you to cleanse me through the cross. I want you to make things right between us. And I want to serve you and love you for all of eternity. You do that in the sincerity of your heart, and he has blotted out everything. And you will be with him forever. Thank you, Lord, for doing this work for us. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.